and welcome to your first look at Total Warfare. My name is Evan Teixeira, Lead Community Manager at Creative Assembly on Total War. And my name is Yusuf Ali, Community Manager on Total War. We're excited to sit down with the developers here at CA Sofia. We'll be joined by Maya Georgieva, Todor Nikolov, and Alexander Georgiev. We'll also be joined by Emmanuel Tomov, Milcho Vasilev, and Christo Enev. And we're very excited to talk about the campaign, the battles. We'll also explore the rich history and beauty behind ancient Egypt and the brutality of the Bronze Age. But first, let's take another look at that awesome announced trailer for Total Warfare. Hi, everybody. Welcome to your first look at Total War Pharaoh. I am happy to be joined by Maya and Todor, uh, who have come in, over from the dev team to come say hello. And we're going to get right into it by asking, what is Total War Pharaoh? Total War Pharaoh, simply put, is the next big historical Total War. It's focused on Egypt, and it aims to encompass all of the Bronze Age Collapse era, bringing everything of relevant of this, you know, exciting time to the, you know, Total War players and uh, to the series. What can players expect from this new historical title? Well, the players can expect to be immersed into the Bronze Age Collapse, the very last portion of the Bronze Age. And this means that they will have to go through a struggle uh, to gain power in order to survive the apocalypse that descends upon the world. They will also be able to play as um, an Egyptian uh, faction or uh, a faction belonging to one of the other Bronze Age cultures from that time period. And who are these different cultures? Do you, can you name them all? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I imagine that at least the playable ones, uh, along with the Egyptians, we are um, portraying the city-states of Canaan and the Hittite Empire that is about to collapse and will likely collapse before the Egyptians. We've had 23 years of historical titles. What's different about Pharaoh from all the ones we've seen in the past? We really have had, you know, a long series, but we haven't had uh, a series focused on Egypt up until now. So this is the first time Total War is exploring Bronze Age Egypt, one of the greatest civilizations ever. And also we're bringing, of course, uh, through an Egypt-centric, you know, point of view, uh, the rest of the Bronze Age collapse uh, as well. What puts, you know, Pharaoh apart is that it kind of reveals this new age and also puts, you know, the player freedom at the center. So we get to, to have like a very, uh, the, the, the freest form of expression in your, in your campaign as much as you can. And uh, actually the very time period that we have chosen, like the end of the 13th century BC, uh, actually helped us because there is relatively little information about some of our characters. So we had to extrapolate a lot to really flesh them out. But at the same time we had to because we're aiming to have these strong characters with recognizable presence in the game. You, you touched on it, but why does this era make for um, an interesting Total War setting? Well, the New Kingdom period, which is 
what we're covering in the game. And it's only a portion of the New Kingdom period. It's when Egypt grew to be an empire and they projected their influence far from the banks of the Nile. And it's perfect for a total war setting. And uh, actually, the military technology also fits the purpose of total war because they had chariots in the older kingdoms that they did not have them. Um, in this particular uh, portion, we're showing a very peculiar kind of Egypt, an Egypt that is that gets gradually torn by uh, civil wars and internal strife. Um, and this is an era ripe for a total war. Apart from that, the entire world slowly sinks into a crisis, which uh, then turns into the collapse of the Bronze Age because all of the civilizations are gradually falling apart in the region. There are a lot of disasters happening and there are also a sort of external danger that also looms above the region. It's really dramatic time yeah. when you have invasions, you have, you know, internal turmoil and strife. And that's what make a, you know, a good, uh, good setting for total war. So this is after the pyramids. It's obviously after the Valley of the Kings. Are, are these the final days of Egypt? Um, kind of, they could be. Uh. <laughs> Historically, they were almost saved by the bell, you know, just 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 by a little bit. Uh, Egypt is, uh, you know, ancient. Egypt, uh, our protagonists, let's say, in in the game, they are, you know, removed from the builders of the period of the pyramids by millennia. Uh, and the, go the saying goes, you know, every, everything fears time. Time fears the pyramids, right? So it kind of we kind of imagine Egypt as something monolithic, something super stable, but it did have crises in in its history, and this is one of the biggest ones, because uh, at the time of the Bronze Age collapse, almost all of the known world was swept away and displaced, basically uh, destroyed. Only Egypt survived, and this is what our players need to do, you know, to save Egypt the way. Ramses did. <laughs> yeah, and what's really fascinating is that we're, we're talking about Egypt right now, like something that lasted millennia and then ceased to be. But in fact, Egyptian culture still lives on. I mean, the fact that we're right now here and we have, uh, we're working on a game that's, you know, like um, glorifying this particular, this particular episode. This, as I said, a tiny fracture of their entire history is amazing. And I often wonder, what would Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians think if they, <laughs> if they realize that in the future there are these people that have this very particular kind of entertainment that uh, is difficult for us to grasp, but they are doing is to honor us. We should be worship cats more. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be proud of what the internet has done. <laughs> yes. Here's a question. Who are the big guy people bringing about this downfall? You talk about this evolution of, into collapse and, and the end of the Bronze Age. What's causing that? The whole thing, the whole collapse was a very complex process. And of course, shrouded in the midst of history, we can only theorize about what exactly happened. But it was a combination of a lot of factors, like um, collapse of trading networks, disasters, and these external threats that the so-called sea peoples. Uh, in the game, they're very much prominent because they serve as a, as a challenge for you to overcome, especially towards the end of the game. Who are the sea peoples? We can only imagine, like some of them are um, coming from the Aegean, uh, some are coming from further west, some of them are raiders and marauders that just arrive here to plunder and destroy. Others actually are displaced and they're looking for a new place to settle. Um, but whether their intentions are actually just to find a new home uh, or not, it matters very little because they turn out to be a threat to every civilization in the area. And it is believed that they brought destruction to the city-states in Greece, to the Hittite Empire in Anatolia, to the many kingdoms in the Levant, and they threatened Egypt itself at the end. But as we mentioned, Ramesses managed to push them back. So we're not talking about mythical Atlanteans coming up. We're talking about a group of people who were coming in and threatening the whole region. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nothing mythical about them. They're just coming here to take what they believe is theirs, and it might be home, <laughs> it might be, you know, goods and uh, shiny stuff. So in Total War Pharaoh, they're the big baddies who are really pushing things along in the game. Yeah. Yeah, you could say that. Uh, Pharaoh is interesting because it's both centered on this, you know, moment in time when civilizations were threatened and were not actually ready to withstand the threat. It, it came by surprise. And uh, Egypt managed, but uh, at the same time, 
it, it wasn't easy, right? And you get to think about what would you, you would do in that situation where you need to probably seize power and also repel an external invasion. So that is not only, you know, uh, the usual total war vying for power, but also thinking about how to also, you know, protect the kingdom that you have afterwards. The experience that we're trying to give to the player in the game is one about gaining power and using that power to survive and overcome the challenges. Like, getting that power is not the ultimate goal. Using that power to protect what is yours is actually, which is a part of the survival thing. Awesome. So it's really about building a kingdom in Egypt and one that would last like we know the Egyptian kingdoms really did. Yeah, <laughs> of course. And the sandbox aspect of the game <clears throat> also kicks in here because you're in no way obliged to, uh, say, become the pharaoh in order to survive. You can try to do it without becoming the pharaoh. Of course, it would be a bit harder for you, very likely, but it still is something that is up to the player to decide. Thank you, Todor. Thank you, Maya, for joining us to give this awesome overview of Total War Pharaoh. We absolutely can't wait to dive into more of this game. back with Todor and welcome Alex. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be discussing the campaign here for Total War Pharaoh. So let's get into it. Tell me about it. The campaign is going to be easily recognized by anyone who has played a Total War game. You send out your armies, you conquer settlements, you develop your settlements, you send even more armies and further on until you, you paint the map as much as you want to. Uh, what we have introduced in the campaign is the addition of uh, very significant choices that you need to make through your playthrough and these make up the faction that you are playing. Amazing. So you've mentioned developing your own play style. So what does this mean for a player to becoming Pharaoh? Well, for example, some of those uh, significant choices that you need to make are, for example, which of the Bronze Age gods do you want to worship? Like, you can't worship every god, but just a limited amount of those. Um, you can also join the court of the Egyptian Pharaoh or the Hittite Great King. Which position exactly do you want to take? Do you want to be a high commander and gain access to more units? Or perhaps the vizier who has uh, more access to some internal court intrigue and stuff like that? But perhaps the most significant choice would be whether you want to become the pharaoh or the Hittite great king. It's interesting. So you can either choose one or the other. You, the whole point of the game is not to, just to become pharaoh? Well, not really. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to choose either of those because this will help you also survive the collapse of the Bronze Age. Are there any other choices, Alex, that you can make? Uh, there is one more choice. You can make. You, you can choose not to become any of those. You can choose to be uh, a brave uh, person and do it by yourself, not uh, uh, regarding yourself with the uh, courting tricks, etc. All this uh, um, noise, if you will, yeah. is going to be hard at all. It's going to be much tougher to do that. But again, do you want to spend your gold in the court, or do you want to spend it on tr on, on troops? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, something interesting here, like all, all of our systems that we're trying to, uh, we're creating, uh, we're creating them with the idea of the sandbox element of the game. So when we're talking about many choices, the player will have the choice to combine all of those systems in, in the in a particular way that they would like to do. So obviously, the evolution of your kingdom is a big deal. Whether you choose to be a pharaoh or whether you choose to be a Hittite king or choose to go the bold path of nothing, but. All of this sort of revolves around this idea of your kingdom evolving from prosperity to crisis to collapse. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's more than your kingdom. It's actually the entire world. This is how we, uh, this is how we portray the collapse of the Bronze Age. Um, the world uh, goes through several distinct states of collapse. <laughs> and it all depends on the pillars of civilization. These are special settlements on the campaign map that we consider core for the Bronze Age civilized world. And these, as these settlements get damaged or even destroyed, the overall level of civilization goes down. And there are, as I said, several different levels. Prosperity, where the world, world is bright and sunny, and you can see it in the game. But as these pillars of civilization get destroyed or damaged, uh, the world will grow foggier as if though there is an impending uh, sandstorm on the horizon, and this is the level of crisis. As you enter the level of crisis, not only the visuals will change, both in campaign and in battle, 
uh, roving barbarian infections, for example, the sea peoples and uh, those tribes that live in the deserts will also get buffs, which will empower them. Mm. And there is a further level of collapse where the world gets darker, uh, like clearer, but darker at the same time. And it really conveys the sense of despair. You are not at the brink of apocalypse at this point. You are within the apocalypse and you need to survive. It takes everything for you to, to push through this. You might not. You might not. You uh, might not uh, survive. Uh, <laughs> Most of the civilizations back then did not survive. They didn't. Yeah. 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 Egypt did. But. Historically, we know what happened during the, uh, the collapse of the Bronze Age. Uh, we have uh, the sea peoples washing over the shores of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. There was probably some uh, apocalyptic event uh, in, in the realm. So we represent this in the game by uh, disasters of uh, different sorts. Uh, uh, they're not visible on the campaign map, but they can affect uh, huge uh, parts of the map. We call them realms. So uh, when you go into collapse, uh, earthquakes, plagues, uh, droughts, they will, they will start to appear uh, much frequently. The player would, be, would like not to be in this place. They, they, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone would. This point. <laughs> so basically, as the world, as you, your civilization goes and collapses, sort of through war or turmoil, the whole world is representing that by collapsing as well. And the thing is, uh, we have uh, civil, uh, um, peers of civilization, those settlements, we have them across the map. So the player might start in Egypt, but uh, all of a sudden in, in, uh, in Canaan, for example, some of those peers of civilization there are destroyed. What is the what can the player do just to uh, uh, amend the situation? They need to go there and, and conquer these lands and just ra uh, raise up these uh, these settlements back. So, if other pillars of civilization are struggling, it will have an impact on the whole world. On the entire map, yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Yes, this, uh, that's why they are pure civilization. They are across the world. So, uh, during your early stage of the game, the player will see how things probably go south. Things are going <laughs> bad, and they won't have the, the, the tools in their hands to, to fix that. But once they become feral, probably, mm -hmm. and probably. you saw those awesome <laughs> power there, they'll be much more um, capable of uh, bringing this back. And once again, depending on the level of uh, difficulty, we are not aiming to provide an easy way out for the players. Only the most dedicated would probably be able to, to achieve prosperity back. Yeah. So you basically need. swing the whole, whole world back into yeah. the happy times. You, you need to conquer it, you need to raise it back to health. Mm. It's, it's going to take it's nice. So you, you touch base um, parts of being pharaoh. So what is the implementation of the crown? How do you become pharaoh? Well, uh, each faction in the game can uh, gain a statistical legitimacy. And the more legitimacy you have, uh, the stronger your claim to the crown of the pharaoh or the throne of the Hittite great king is. Sure. And in order to increase your legitimacy, you need to uh, own territory that is part of the Egyptian or the Hittite empire. And there are additional ways that you can increase your legitimacy. For example, you can build monuments to your name. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also uh, conquer the land of your neighbors. And if they contain monuments, you will just usurp them so that you can use them yourself, <laughs> which is something that historically happened in ancient Egypt and not only. So you gain le uh, legitimacy and at some point when you have reached a sufficiently high level, you can proclaim yourself to be the actual pharaoh. Uh. Now, it really much depends if there is a single pharaoh at the moment, mm -hmm. in which case it is harder to do so. Yep. Um, but in case there is no single pharaoh, which is going to be at some point the state of the game for the Egyptians, because all pharaoh Merneptah Mar will die at some point. These are spoilers. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I should have given a sign before that. Yeah. Uh, the only one who is got dying. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it will be it will be much easier for you to proclaim yourself a pharaoh if there is no single sitting pharaoh. And then you enter a period of civil war that you will have to push through, and you will have to be the faction with the most uh, legitimacy at the end. In mm -hmm. which case you become the single ruling pharaoh, and you enjoy the, the full privileges of, of being a pharaoh. Mm. And before uh, talking about the privilege, privileges, there is something uh, I think interesting. Uh, we have this uh, David to Goliath type of story, because uh, we start with uh, limited resources and limited lands. To become eligible for the crown, you need to have at least one sacred land. 
So this is like a fairy tale. Like you have this sacred land, now you can strive to become the pharaoh. There are like many other things that you need to do, many more lands to conquer, many more monuments to construct. <laughs> But uh, this is the path. You start from one single land. So anybody, a, a canon faction, can go in Egypt, conquer one land, and all of a sudden become eligible to become the pharaoh. Yeah, it's actually the, the choice that we mentioned earlier that you can that you get to choose whether you want to become the pharaoh or the Hittite great king, and it is possible for an Egyptian faction, for example, to it would be more straightforward if they go for being a pharaoh, but they can also head north mm -hmm. to Anatolia, conquer a bit of Hittite land and proclaim themselves uh, themselves a pretender for the uh, for the throne mm -hmm. of the Hittite great king which did not actually happen in history although at some point there was a Hittite prince who uh, was invited actually to go to Egypt and become the pharaoh but he was ambushed and uh, killed and ruled but in terms of uh, legitimacy generally we can see it in history. If you have enough lands and okay. enough uh, other claims to legitimacy, you can go and try to, to, to claim the crown. Yeah, I remember that in the very beginning we were wondering, is this actually a plausible scenario? Mm. But yeah, enough research and confirmed with some experts, uh, it turned out that almost everything that would work in any state in history is also applicable for ancient of Egypt. Wow. We're humans. And that's why we like history history games so much. Like uh, the stories there are just as fascinating as any fantasy that you can imagine. Like real life. Incredible. It's fascinating. So thank you, Todor. Thank you, Alex. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. We cannot wait to dive into the campaign mechanics of this. So cool. Uh, but first, here's a quick sneak peek at the campaign map. Enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome, Christo, Miljo. Pleasure to have you both to talk battles today. Well, for Total War Pharaoh, we wanted to make sure that battles feel a lot more historical and realistic. Of course, we, being in the Bronze Age, have some limited access to different unit types. Uh, so we have tried to focus uh, even more with our features on the infantry versus infantry combat. Um, for example, the unit stances feature. Yeah. Uh, unit stance is a new feature uh, that actually replaces the formations we had in old total, old total Wars. So they're basically orders that you give to units, but instead of a movement or attack order, they're actually uh, order to go forward or an order to go backwards while facing forward. Yeah, we have also um, introduced a lot of new animations and the way the animations work for um, infantry versus infantry combat. Uh, you are now going to see a lot of more um, matched combat, matched animations between uh, the different units. Uh, you will see it's actually defending against attacks, then striking back. We have also um, introduced a lot more um, varied battle maps that have a lot more features uh, built into them that will bring more tactical decisions to the player that is in command of their armies. So now they can find those uh, features like cliffs or forests or different difficult terrains or water that can protect them from the side and try to exploit them in the best way that they can. Thus, for example, try to create their own choke point battle or find a good place on the map where they can ambush the enemy while they're coming at them. Amazing, so like the dynamic like terrain and stuff has been completely changed um, for Total War Pharaoh, so you can really take advantage of your, of your yes. battles against yeah. your enemies. Uh, well, we had weather system in previous Total Wars, but now we're introducing a dynamic change to the weather. So for example, a battle can start in a rain environment uh, and it can gradually become a storm or even a thunderstorm. 
uh, and that can change the terrain as well. Uh, in rain, uh, there will be patches of mud appearing on the battlefield. And for example, in a sandstorm, there will be patches of sand just gradually building up. On yeah, and all those parts have uh, effects on the units that uh, are going to be on the battlefield. Uh, for an example, heavier units or chariots are going to find it hard to move through mud and uh, that ter sort of terrain. Sand is going to exhaust units m yeah. moving through it uh, faster, um, depending again on how light they are, thus giving the lighter units more advantage when they're fighting on sand. And the weather itself is going to change the way some of the units behave. For example, archers are going to find it much harder to hit their targets when they're trying to shoot in a sandstorm. So you can course, imagine yeah. how hard <laughs> that can be. So the dynamic weather has, like, again, completely changed the way uh, you look at battles now. So you've got rain, you've got thunderstorms. Is there anything else we can expect from weather? Yes, uh, there is also fog, which is uh, from previous Total Wars. There is sandstorm, which I mentioned before. And there is sweltering weather, which is a desert being really hot. It's so very warm, Basically. very, very hot. Yeah, this will have a huge <laughs> impact on the exhaustion levels yes. of your units, and you need to be careful oh, when wow. you're fighting in a sweltering uh, weather conditions. Uh, the players are not going to be uh, expecting the dynamic weather in every battle mm -hmm. that they're yeah. fighting. They will need to adapt to Yeah, they, this is the something that they need to adapt to and right. see how their tactics might change because if they have thought that they can take a certain approach towards the enemy, but then a rain, rain comes out and makes it so that this whole terrain becomes so muddy, they might um, think that this approach might not be as good for their chariots, for example, and need to change their battle plans on the fly when those things happen. Choosing where you fight basically will depend on the type of army that you're building and mm. want to have. For example, it's a very natural thing that the Egyptians have much lighter armies that are going to be finding it easier to fight when they're on sand or in sweltering weather because their armor is usually not as heavy and they're kind of used to that type of terrain. Whereas the Hittites being more heavily armored and um, not so used used to this type of terrain are going to be finding it much harder when they need to fight in the sand. See. Well. On the other hand, they are heavier with better armor, so in hand-to-hand -hand engagements when the Egyptians are not using the advantage of their terrains around them, the Hittites might have an upper hand in that. Mm. Yeah. And there are even units that have even more advantage when fighting in the desert just because they're suited and they've lived their whole lives in the desert. <laughs> That's awesome. So it sounds like there are a ton of factors that weigh in any battle from the unit you're bringing to the field to the weather. What else is in Total War Pharaoh that makes it different from other titles in the historical Total War catalog? Well, we have improved on the way sieges work and introduced a number of new things there. Um, well, fire being one of the big ones. Now, we've had fire before and we've seen fire in Total War games from a long time ago, but now it is uh, much more dynamic and it can spread around and the player can deliberately set certain places of either a settlement or even a forest ablaze uh, so that they can use this uh, for it as a tactical advantage if this is a type of tactic that they want to employ. Um, setting a settlement on fire is going to make it easier for the attacker to try and capture it, but then again it will also make it so that later if they want to repair it and keep it after capturing it, it will be much more expensive to repair their, that city. And the local population is probably not going to be as happy <laughs> yeah, yeah. to set their city ablaze when we are trying to fight so them. It's smart. Burn their <laughs> yeah. the um, also, but <laughs> yeah. the fire is, as I said, dynamic, so it will spread around. So even if you are trying to employ a tactic in which you're trying to burn the enemy city down, you need to be careful as to how you're doing it, because the way the fire spreads, it your units might suffer from that as well. Don't win the battle really fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, because it uh, fire doesn't recognize friend from foe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, and another thing about sieges is that we have removed pocket ladders, finally, and uh, we've replaced them with siege ladders. So we will have siege ladders, siege towers, uh, battering rams, and then the new thing that the ancient Egyptians love to do, wall sapping. 
they yeah, they uh, undermined the undermined walls, the wall yeah, and walls that of, of the yeah. settlements so yeah. that it can actually crumble down yeah. and create an uh, opening for the for the attacking army. Now the wall sapping doesn't happen dynamically on the battlefield, but in the campaign, if the player decides to invest a few turns in undermining the walls of the settlement, they can actually bring some of them down and then start the assault which will make them fight in a different yeah. battle map, which has already some of the walls broken down, and the enemy needs to find different ways in which to defend their settlement instead of just placing soldiers over the walls. It sounds like historical accuracy is really important in total warfare. We have tried to make sure that uh, this game is as historically authentic as we possibly can make it. Of course, there are some gameplay elements that still need to be present for, or it, for it to work. Yeah. But uh, all the units that we've done, the way the settlements have been done, the way they have been designed, we have been looking at ancient maps and ancient uh, representations of certain settlements and uh, armor and equipment and all those things to make sure that they look exactly as yeah. they looked back then. And then we do try to improve on how chariots work. Because uh, you can't have a Bronze Age game without chariots. Uh, we have a few different types of chariots, but the main thing is that we increase the number of chariots you have. And chariots are really, really powerful for Pharaoh. We wanted to make sure that armies look large with a lot of chariots mm. in them. So now instead of just having 12 or 18 chariots in a unit, you are going to have up to 30 chariots yeah. in the unit wow. and they're still going to okay. maneuver around the battlefield uh, well. The way you use chariots, if you decide to try and employ them in your tactics, is going to be very important because they can be amazingly strong when used in the right yeah. way and be very expensive and not effective at all if used in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, can, you can get a uh, chariot stuck in mud, for example, or in sand if it's a heavy chariot. And that's not a good position to be. It's absolutely amazing. So it just the complexity of it. It's no longer mm. just a power play. It is a, you got to consider all these factors in your battle. Yes. If the player is utilizing the terrain the way they are supposed to, <laughs> the way they should, and if the player is uh, playing to the strengths of their own army and to the weaknesses of the enemy army, they are going to have a lot more chances to win a battle that actually might look very, very bad for them <laughs> in yeah. the beginning. Milcho, Christo, thank you for joining us to talk about battles. Oh my god, that was so much in so there. Good. So good. Siege ladders, yes. dynamic weather, yes. fire. Yes. Let's take a quick look at those beautiful battle maps and a special look at the city of Menifer. Back to Todor. Welcome, Emma. So we are going to be talking about the culture and history of Total War Pharaoh. So let's get right into it. Tell me about the New Kingdom of Egypt. Yeah. Uh, so the New Kingdom is the period in which Egypt grows to a majestic empire. It takes place between the 16th and the 11th century BC, and we're looking at a period right at the end after the um, uh, Egyptian empire has reached its uh, you know, topmost position and it start, like, started to slowly grow into, go into decline. So Egyptian deities were a huge part of Egyptian um, culture. So what part do they play in total war pharaoh? Different subsets of deities were revered in different parts of the realms. And we are reflecting this in the game by having different subsets of deities being available in each realm and whereupon you discover uh, this subset and you are able to worship them sort of like you've encountered this local cult and you've decided that this is a god worth worshiping because it suits you <laughs> usually <laughs> sure yeah and the challenge that we have in the game is that we're not only showing the egyptian gods but we're also showing the gods of the hittites and the canaanites sure. 
And the main problem is that we can't include absolutely every DT. That's that's impossible because the Hittites, for example, they had... They, they supposedly had a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So, <laughs> so they thousand. Really, it would went be, into uh, details. It would <laughs> be a bit mechanics heavy, the game. Yeah. And also, we would, we would need every Slow little man. village and group <laughs> of people to have their own separate god, <laughs> which would be kind of difficult to implement, honestly. Of course. Now, I know you, you just mentioned that you've got all these different cultures for, with all of these different deities. And obviously, we're representing a territory all the way from up in Turkey, down through Egypt, all the way down to Sudan. So can you tell me a little bit about the cultures in Total War Pharaoh and sort of the role they play in the game? Well, the playbook cultures are three. You have the Egyptians, the Canaanites, and the Hittites. Uh, and there are also cultures that are not playable. For example, to the west uh, of the Nile, there are the, the Libu tribes that are living as desert nomads, occasionally threatening you. But perhaps occasionally you can strike a truce with them and perhaps even hire some of their units. We have tried to express the cultural diversity of the Bronze Age with every, every tool that we had at our disposal. Um, for example, different uh, cultures have different units. They also inhabit different climates on the campaign map. So you will be fighting on desert battle maps or uh, battle maps around the Nile or in oases when you're fighting anywhere in Egypt, while the battle maps in Anatolia are more green and lush with imposing mountains in the background. Um, so the, the architecture of the battle maps itself, the various buildings are also reflects the different cultures. And we have even gone into further details. For example, as part of your character development, you can assign different titles to your characters. And these are also specific to different cultures. And uh, some of them are specific to different factions. So how have you captured the different cultures from those different regions in the game, specifically? Well, on, on the more narrative side, um, we have tried to express uh, the character of uh, the cultures through actual characters, uh, which would be uh, the more generic kind of commanders and generals that you play with uh, on the campaign map. Uh, and since they are a very uh, um, predominant part of what you do uh, in the game, uh, we have tried to differentiate them as characters. And all of them have specific quirks. Uh, the Egyptians are a bit haughty for example. Uh, the Nubian Egyptians, uh, sort of long after the lost glory of the Kush kingdom, which was subjugated by Egypt at some point uh, during the New Kingdom. Uh, the Canaanites are ready for everything because they've seen everything. Uh, their country has been, uh, their uh, land has been a battleground for great empires for centuries. They're used to everything. Uh, they're a bit nihilistic, uh, uh, but still they uh, h hold out hope that their children might inherit something livable. Okay. And the, the Hittites uh, are sort of divided between the type of Hittite leader that might want to keep their community together uh, and protect their community, and the other one who is just a mercenary at, how, uh, at heart and uh, try to uh, simply find uh, profit where he can. Who are the faces, who are the rulers we are going to see in the game? Like who, are, who are the faces we're going to love and who are we going to hate in Pharaoh? Well, I, I certainly hope that uh, one can find uh, 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 things to be endeared about, you know, uh, in terms of every character that they play with. And uh, all of them have their quirks, but all of them also have humanity, I, I hope. And I, I hope that we have tried to express that uh, in, uh, in the game scripts and whatnot. Uh, otherwise, the three cultures are represented by, uh, respectively, uh, the Egyptian culture by four characters, uh, the Canaanites are two, and the Hittites are also two. And uh, all of them have their own reasons and claim to, to glory and to, to ruling, while others uh, might fall more on the side of the spectrum that just wants to prove that they are strong. These two representatives that we have of on one side, the desire to unite and to leave something for the ages that will be everlasting. This is our uh, quote unquote main character who is Ramses, later to become Ramses III. How he starts out the game is as almost a child. Uh, he's very, very young, um, but uh, he has been given the rulership over Sinai 
which is a border region uh, of Egypt that is between Egypt and uh, Canaan. And uh, it's basically his proving grounds. And from there on, he wants to show everyone that he is simply the best person for the job. Uh, he is extremely talented. Uh, and everything that he's tried so far has worked, uh, including keeping in check the, the raids of the most fearsome raider in one of our other characters, uh, the most fearsome raider by reputation of that time, uh, Ursu, who is a Canaanite uh, uh, war chief. Historically, we only know the name of that character, so uh, we needed to do some narrative work in order to uh, create a character for him. Shrouded in mystery. <laughs> yeah, we, we unshroud some of that mystery, yeah. uh, and we give him motivation and whatnot. He hates Ramses' guts. While <laughs> Ramses doesn't see what the big deal is, this is just some raider. Well, for Ursu, this isn't a game. He survived for decades, barely. He has a thousand wounds to speak of how he managed to survive. And for him, the fact that this child is uh, getting in his way of raiding and ravaging and sacking all of Egypt uh, is a real problem. He, indeed, one of the things that I like about Ersu is that he does not really understand the, the necessity of ruling a land, mm -hmm. uh, except for this is a, a proper source of riches and sure. uh, things you can consume. This is how he works, this is how he understands the world, sure. which is quite different from Ramesses, who has this duty to, to perform well, like to defend his homeland, and in this prove his own worth. Right. Because Ramesses, if I remember correctly, he's very much uh, wants to take after Ramesses II, his namesake. Yes. The great pharaoh before him, mm -hmm. the father of Merneptah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what he's going to try and do in the game. Yeah. So thank you, Toto. Thank you, Manuel, for joining us. Oh my goodness, the culture and history of the game. We're just blown away by all of this. But before we wrap up, a very special treat for you all. Here is the opening cinematic for Total War Pharaoh. Enjoy. Thank you all for joining us. We're incredibly excited to share a first look at Total War Pharaoh. And we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of what's to come. There's a ton on the way in the next few months. So remember that pre-orders are open and that by pre-ordering, you'll be ready to play day one when the game releases this October. And that's us from Sophia and the New Kingdom of Egypt. Here's one final look at the trailer of Total War Pharaoh. Enjoy.